You know, it never before have we been able to connect with people the way we have in the past. So think for a moment of missionaries who are overseas, they don't get to see their family much, and they're able to use social media to connect to family and to keep in touch with friends and to connect to their support base. You have people with disabilities who will connect. Um, they form groups and connect online, and especially those with very, um, very unknown uh, diseases. And across countries and across seas, people are connecting and they're finding like-mindedness and understanding and resources. There's wonderful things about technology. Technology is a tool to be used in our hands. We can either use it and for good or we can use it for evil. I have a son. Uh, my son at 11 years old started showing signs that he needed glasses and we took him to the doctor and found out that actually he has a disease that will take away all of his central vision. And so through the course of the last four or five years, he's now a teenager, he's been slowly losing his central vision. It's a disease that actually we have, we've connected with groups online to find out more about it. Um, and it's really interesting to watch how people communicate and get resources and talk. But for Andrew, his name's Andrew, for Andrew, technology is his lifeline. This is a child who, had technology not been invented yet, he'd be in a school for the blind, um, and he'd be limited to that. Now, because of modern day technology, he can do almost everything he has to do for school on an iPad, and he can be in a normal school. He's actually in a, in a private Christian school, but he can be there without any help because he's got technology that's teaching him. He's got a vision teacher, but technology is his lifeline. Technology will be the reason that a visually impaired person can live in the world and succeed and do things never imagined before. There are wonderful, wonderful things I appreciate about technology. So I feel like I just have to put all that out there before I say all the things that are driving me crazy about technology. Um, there are very, very good things. And so we start with understanding technology is simply a tool, right? And it's how we choose to use that that determines the good and the evil in it. So now I'm going to talk about all the hard things I am seeing happen in technology, especially in our young people. Um, and then I really want to, by the end, be very practical and say, here's principles. So especially with technology, um, when it first came out, I was very strongly talking about it in the way of stewardship, because that's how I think as a parent, that's how I think of a counselor. Like We're called to steward our lives, whether it's our bodies, whether it's our relationships, whether it's our finances. Technology is something that enters into our world. What does a stewardship mentality look like for the Lord in this? However, what I'm coming to find out is that I have a lot more concerns about how technology is impacting young people, and maybe for some reasons different than even some of the ones I'm going to start talking about. So we all can imagine, you're all here because you can imagine or are already experiencing the struggles with teens and technology. But I think there's very core, deep relational issues going on with young people today as a result of technology as well, and, and I want to talk about that. So let me give you a picture of my concern. Um, how many of you would give the keys of your car to a 16-year-old? Any of you? Depending, let's assume semi-mature 16-year-old, right? How many of you would give it to a 14-year-old? Depending, right? How many would give it to a 10-year-old? Seriously, should not be raising your hands for a 10-year-old, <laughs> really. However, think about this. Technology is very much like us giving our car keys to a 10-year-old. Not even to a 10-year-old anymore, right? There's seven-year-olds, there are eight-year-olds who are receiving keys. Why wouldn't we give keys to the car to a 10-year-old? Well. We're assuming no 10-year-old is really going to accurately know how to drive, right? If their feet can even reach the pedals, which would be a key reason not to, we would say, yeah, but that child is 10. They don't have the cognitive development. They don't have the skills. They don't have, they just don't have the maturity to know that when you get in the car, it's not just about whether you can turn the car on and drive it, right? It is that there is a world out there we're exposing them to that is equally dangerous to them as much as it is for them, a 10-year-old, being out driving a car. Um, and when we see those things happen on the news, it normally doesn't end well either. 
However, we don't hesitate to take an instrument like this and put it in the hands of a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old, and it opens up a world that we have not ever prepared them for. That is my concern. That's not simply a tool for playing video games or staying connected to their friends. It is a world we are opening up to them. And very few adults, by the way, are prepared for that world. I point out to my kids all the time that you cannot go in a restaurant and look around and you can rarely find a table where somebody's not on a cell phone, disconnected from the people that they should be connected to right in front of them and engaging it with them. So if most adults are not handling social media and technology well, how on earth do we expect young people to? Who's stewarding them? Who's teaching them to do that? And are we teaching them the right things? So let's start by me giving you some examples of that. I want you to take a minute and look at these statistics and think what stands out to you about them. Despite people have very strong opinions of social media, very strong opinions about technology and who kids and whether kids should be using and things like that, but let's just stick for a minute with just the statistics, just the facts and what it says. So 92% of teenagers go online daily and 24% say they go online almost constantly. 76% of teens use social media, 81% of older teens, and 68% of teens ages 13 and 14. 71% of teens use Facebook, though I'm hearing that's totally taboo now, it's old. 52% use Instagram, 41% use Snapchat, 33% use Twitter, that's going up a lot by the way, and 14% use Tumblr. 77% of parents say their teens get distracted by their devices and don't pay attention when they're together. By the way, I think the percentage of parents getting distracted by their social media and technology is equally as high, which brings problem number two, right? 59% of parents say they feel their teen is addicted to their mobile device. 50% of teens say they feel addicted to their mobile device. What do you think about those statistics? Yet, I hear this. And this stuff is out there all the time, yet very few parents and adults are doing anything about it. Why is that? I'd argue that there is a cultural and social pressure for families to be buying their kids' cell phones and technology. And with that comes that there is a, a cultural pressure that they should be online as well and connected to social media. And parents, who aren't doing that are seen as what? Stoic, Amish in nature, mean-spirited, helicopter parenting. We have lots of labels we put on that. And we've got to stop and think. So actually, a lot of teachers, I heard a lot of educators, and a lot of people say, yeah, this is a problem. Yeah, we can't get kids to focus. Yeah, we can't do this. But then I want you to think for a minute. How many schools actually embrace social media as a way to connect their students too? How many public schools and even private schools are now using laptops and iPads as a way of having kids online doing work? Then you think of sports clubs and activity clubs who probably rightly so, rightly ordered, are using social media things to connect their, their sports teams, to send emails out. So parents who might not want their kids to have cell phones at an early age are finding that they're also isolating their kids from very things like their sports team being able to communicate a canceled basketball game, or the art club being able to communicate where the next art show is going to be. So we're creating this cycle effect where we're saying, yes, we believe this is bad for our students, and our students are way too addicted to it, but then the adults are the ones who are continuing to perpetuate the need for it. So I am one of those conservative parents, uh, or so my kids tell me, and they, um, we desire to have a stewardship mentality, I'll put it that way. What I found is that we struggle because we think, well, it's the good kids are going to handle it well, and the bad kids aren't going to handle it well. And I think that is, complete, um, that is completely untrue, not accurate at all, because there is a world that is out to, to pursue your children, to pursue my children, to pursue children we work with. That my kids, if I'm raising them right, are naive to all the dangers that are on technology, right? 
and I don't want them to know of all the evils and danger. I want them exposed to it, but that also means they're naive to it, which means they're not possibly prepared for all the ways pedophiles and chat rooms and even shopping and things like that, all the way that, that media is pursuing them. So you have very good kids who would never dream of doing bad things, but these things are pursuing them. And they find themselves get caught up in that because they're ill-prepared. Just like a 10-year-old with a car keys, they don't know what they're getting into. They don't understand the ramifications once they're out on the highway. And there are so many ways where our kids are intentionally targeted, even just the mass media convincing them to buy things or need things. And I just said this in my last workshop, that the mass media exists to sell products. It exists to sell values and values of morality and themes of morality and sexuality and relationships. And our kids are just soaking and basking in it and images are coming at them thousands a day, changing them and shaping the way they think they should feel. So if that's bombarding them at all times, how could we not think that's gonna shape them and affect them and begin to change them? We've got to understand that it's not good kids and bad kids and how they use technology. It is actually a, a culture that is pursuing, actively pursuing young people and changing the way they think. And then on top of it, we're expecting young, when I say immature, I don't mean that in a negative way, but young, immature, impressionable people. And we're exposing them to a world that has a lot to say to them. And if that, that voice starts to get louder and louder in their lives, then guess whose voice gets softer and softer in their lives? So where does it lead? We th see things like depression, eating disorders, self-harming behaviors, substance abuse, bullying, cyberbullying. Let me slow down for a minute and think about this. So depression. About a year ago, Atlantic Monthly, you can Google it, they came out with this really um, articulate research about uh, particularly teen girls and depression and pinpointed it to social media and said the use of social media, now isn't this interesting, because social media is supposed to bring people together, right? It's supposed to connect people and it, it claims to be more relational. Um, but it was showing that teen girls were becoming more connected than ever and more anxious and depressed than ever. Well, why would that be? Because what it was doing was it was creating a, a vacuum of any mature godly adults in their life and it was their peers becoming their own source of wisdom. Now, Atlantic Monthly didn't say that, that's my words, but you were seeing this theme where the more kids were pursued by social media, the more it was this appearance, this image, that these are the things that they should be wanting and pursuing after, and they were becoming more anxious, they were becoming more depressed. And here's the theme that you're gonna hear me say for the next hour, that is this theme of peers influencing peers. Peers, teens becoming their own source of wisdom to one another. And that is actually, to me, the most alarming thing about social media these days for our young people is that our, our adult voices are slowly being pushed out of their lives. But wisdom is entering in, or their source of wisdom in their mind is entering in. So for example, it used to be that kids would go to school and they would come home from school and they'd be with their parents and have conversations and eat family meals together and depending on the busyness of family life and social activities, or they went to church together. But nowadays, a child's in school all day long with their peers, and half the time they're on this, right? But they're in school all day long with their peers. Then they come home, you maybe get a hello, and they go into the room, shut their door, and they're right back on this, or the iPad, or their computer, or the Xbox, or whatever gaming system they are. And I've heard lots of teens from a counseling standpoint stand in front of me and say, well, Julie, that's where, that's where I decompress. Or Julie, that's where my friends and I, we talk about stuff. So you talk about stuff while you're, while you're shooting missiles across the screen at each other. Yeah, yeah, we have great conversations, meaningful conversations. But what I'm finding is that they go home and they're, they're constantly on this with each other. And adult voices are not in their lives anymore. Teens aren't being mentored anymore. They're not learning to do relationship. There's this great book called Reclaiming Conversation by Sherry Turkle. Not a Christian, but she wrote just talking about going into schools. School administrators were asking her to come in and saying, we've got 
14, 15 year old teenagers that don't know how to go outside and interact with each other. They don't know how to play, they don't know how to engage. It's like they're developmentally delayed because they don't know how, what to do without a screen. And she talks about the need to reclaim conversation, that when we're not face to face with each other and communicating with each other, that something changes both developmentally, but I would argue relationally. So the best the world does is they can see the effects, the negative effects of social media and the negative effects of these things, but they don't understand what's underneath it. And I'd argue that as believers, we know that there's something inherently relational, that we were made to live in relationship, that we were made to need wisdom outside ourselves, right? And what is my greatest concern is we already have a culture that pursues our kids and shapes the way they think about values and morality, but now we don't have any adult voices in that world either. Their world, their social media is not engaging relatives and mature godly counsel, is it? Do you think that's who they're connecting with on Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat? No. So they're, they're slowly pushing out any, adore, any mature adult interaction, and they are becoming this contained source of wisdom. And that should be very scary to us. So you have that, and then you have the issue of relationship, where even some of the best secular research out there is showing that kids' relationship, they don't know how to do relationship anymore. We're talking conversation. They don't know how to do conversation. But ultimately, that means we don't know how to do relationship. We don't understand how to do empathy, where you can't read people's facial features or understand them or, or feel compassion for another person. Your world shrinks and becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And so you see that with depression, that um, a teen girl, especially, who wants approval. She's looking to her peers. She's trying to find where she fits in. And not many of us post the negative things on Facebook. And those who do, you tend to like want to delete or block because you don't want to listen to their, their whining or complaining. We tend to put our best face forward. We try to uh, we present a facade of who we are. And that's what young people do. They want to be cool. They want to look like they fit in. But they're equally comparing their lives and thinking how bad their life is compared to what they're seeing online as well. So you have the struggle with depression. With depression can often come eating disorders, or social media is often about how many likes can I get. My value and my identity and my worth starts to be wrapped in, am I getting likes? Is anybody glancing at my Twitter account? Has anybody said anything about my Snapchat? And so value and identity is being found in that, which also leads, especially young women, into appearance struggles, body image issues, eating disorders. Self-harming behaviors goes hand in hand with depression and anxiety and feeling like I can't be good enough. You see in certain places like in Silicon Valley how the use of social media also perpetuates the struggle for grades and fitting in and success. So all different kind of values that can be competing at kids depending on kind of their geographics and how they're raised and what the cultural values are. Bullying and cyberbullying have been huge. If you look into kids who are committing suicide or becoming suicidal, a lot of this is happening cyber. It's happening online. Um, so again, even kids who were bullied, which is terrible enough, at school at least could come home and have a reprieve. Think about that now. There's no reprieve. As a matter of fact, it can take one picture to wipe out someone's reputation online. And it just goes viral and gets passed around the school. And I've heard a young girl and young girl after another who have come into counseling who have sent a, a naked picture to somebody or they felt the pressure to give one and then that was sent out to a whole school. And now they can't think of showing up in school. They can't go on any kind of social media without that picture showing up. And you just have these horrific stories of people, of teens who can't think life can get any better than this, that this is the end of my life as I know it and they can't see a way out and they become suicidal or they, they have these self-harming. So you see all these struggles. The objectification of others. That is even true of us, I think, with Facebook. So I'll try to pick on us as adults for a minute. How often we go on Facebook and we see people's happy pictures and their vacations and all the nice things they're doing. And have you ever felt a twinge of envy? I have, especially when they're on cruise. I was going to say cruises, but right now I don't think I envy anybody on cruises. <laughs> Um, I'm like, you're crazy going on that cruise with the coronavirus. 
you see all these struggles of people presenting, they're putting their best foot forward and they're presenting a life of happiness and everybody's smiling and, and they've got three kids that are well-dressed and behaved and smiling and you've got to know that's not real all the time, right? But we present, we put a picture, a best face forward that causes us each to covet. The flip side of that is also it causes us to objectify one another too. We see people as possessions or things, and this is what probably worse, um, more graphically, we see that with teens, especially in the issue of pornography and sexting, and that is at epidemic proportions. I have rarely met a teenager, at least in a counseling setting, who I can't ask, hey, has anybody ever asked you for a naked picture or offered to give you one? And I don't think I've met a teenager yet who has said no. Doesn't mean they've all participated, though most of them have, by the way. But they've all, it's not a if it happens to you, it's a when it happens to you. So imagine as a parent saying, I'm gonna give you this phone, and by the way, I should probably explain texting and pornography to you because it will happen to you. Now here you go. Is there something wrong with that? Now on the flip side, what I am saying is I don't think you can or should hand over a phone to a teenager without having that conversation either. So do you, see the, do you see how that's at odds, the complexity of saying, if I am going to give them to this, I've got to be willing to have these conversations. And if I'm willing to have these conversations, do I really want my teenagers exposed to this yet? I know kids whose parents cannot give them technology. And they can get on a school bus. And before they ever make it to school, by 8 o'clock in the morning, they've been exposed to pornography. There's no guarantee. I'm not arguing circle the wagons and never let your kids have technology. I am saying it is a concern across the board. But we would be foolish and unwise not to ask, is it worth it? And why are we feeling the pressures to earlier and earlier give it to teenagers and young people? And I will speak as a parent now, I feel the pressure for two reasons. One is because I do see more and more schools causing kids to need it causing them to need to communicate through text messaging or email or things that I might hold off a couple of years giving my kids because I think it's wise to do. I'm seeing the pressure now that by doing that, there's headaches you're creating. I also feel for my children who do look and act differently than the kids around them. So think for a minute. My teenagers, and a couple of them do have cell phones, and we've been very guarded with where they have it and how they have it, so I'll talk about some principles. And they are just principles, because you need to be an expert at knowing your own kids or the kids you're ministering to. You can come up with any kind of rule and any kind of formula, and kids will find a way to break it and go around it. So it is not the rules. It's not the formulas that will win them. It's giving them a heart to want to please the Lord and live rightly before him that really matters. However, it is also understanding that are we, are we inadvertently exposing our children to something sooner than they are prepared emotionally and spiritually to handle? And hopefully that's the theme you hear come from this. It's not me saying, here's the rule, follow this rule and your kids will be safe. It's here's the principles, understand why they're important, and can kids handle them? Can individual kids handle them? So we have two kids that have cell phones. Our son who's visually impaired has a cell phone, but he uses it only when he's going to do mobile therapy and he's learning. There's apps on this phone that helps a visually impaired person to be able to cross streets and find their way through cities and all kinds of great things. Well, that'd be unloving for me to withhold that from him, right? I need to give him the tools to be able to be independent and thrive. I also need to know that that easily can become an addiction for him to have that phone on him and to not be able to do without it. We have a teenage daughter that's driving, that is uh, going to work. And I've got to say, as a parent, it's really nice to be able to know I can text her at any time and reach her if I need to or communicate certain things. But there's also a dark side to that, right? Because if I have access to her at all times, guess who else does? That's part of the problem. I couldn't even begin to guess who else has access to her all the time. And the temptation that even if you've got a great relationship with your child and you say, honey, please don't give anybody your phone number unless you've asked with us first or here's the five people we're okay with or the 20 people we're okay with, the pressure of other people saying, oh, come on, let me have your phone number. I'm just going to text you a picture. And now all of a sudden that person has their phone number and it's somebody I probably wouldn't want her to have the phone number to. And then five other people, that person's going to give her a phone number out to five other people. And those five people are not going to be pleasant people that might ask her for 
for sexting or might ask her to meet them after work or do all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, a world has opened up that you and I are utterly clueless to. And it happens that fast. And that's just with texting, not to mention Snapchat and Twitter and all these other social media sites where people are actively pursuing our young people. So you and I could think, I have a very mature 15-year-old or 16-year-old, but we're not thinking, but are they prepared to handle all the evils that are about to come after them as a result of this technology? And it's so important to ask that question because even if you still give them that technology, at least you're prepared to start talking about the hard stuff. Does that make sense? Am I making anybody paranoid yet? <laughs> the minimization of mature, healthy relationships, and as I said, that peers become their own source of wisdom. I don't hear a lot of research on that. I don't hear a lot of talk about that, but those would be the top two concerns for me. That their world, they become their own source of wisdom to each other, and we're being shut out. Any mature input, any mentoring is being shut out of their lives. Why are parents allowing this? If that's the case, well, why in the world would we allow these things to happen? And I'd say a lot of it is because we haven't thought it through. We're behind the times. We're just learning technology. And the faster we're learning it, the faster teens are learning to outsmart it, by the way. So here's the privilege of being a counselor, because as a parent, I probably wouldn't know this either. But I go to counseling. I meet with teens. And they tell me they've got caught doing things they're not supposed to do. And I'll say, so how did you do that? And they'll start telling me how they did that. I'm like, hmm, I'm going to go home and check my child's cell phone now. Things I didn't even know possible to do or ways of hiding apps and apps, or ways of creating an app that has a separate phone number so they can have this whole other world you don't know about. Or you can have an app that looks like a calculator, and it is really a secret account where people are sending pictures and photos and videos and, and interacting with each other, and parents never know it, even if it's on the phone. Because a parent checks the child's phone, they open it up, there you have it. It just looks like a calculator. So you have all kinds of struggles where we just haven't thought it through enough, or we haven't thought through the implications of kids having a cell phone right next to their bed all night long while it's going off. And again, guess what? The, the research is showing kids aren't getting enough sleep. They're not sleeping through the night. They're constantly online. Even the light of the screens keep kids awake. They're talking about how posture is being impacted by social media, all this crazy stuff that we just, we never would have thought of before. Yeah, the cultural pressure is what all the kids are doing. So I'll go back to, I'll keep telling stories of my kids because it's a little easier. You know, we have a teenage daughter who is playing basketball and she would ask, can I take my phone on, can I take my phone with me for basketball? And I thought, didn't want her to have her phone in school, really want to focus. I'm one of those parents that wants her to focus on relationship, focus on being in school, focus on having fun with friends. And I say, honey, sit in the bus and talk to people. That's what we did growing up, and I wasn't with the dinosaurs yet. Like we, People knew how to talk and have fun and sing on their way to basketball games. And she would say, but mom, you don't understand. Everybody else is on their phone. I'm just sitting there by myself. Well, that's heartbreaking. What, what is the point of me sending her to sit by herself on a bus if everybody around her is on their cell phone and nobody's talking to her? Am I just not isolating her as well? So then I'm sitting there going, well, that feels awful. I don't want her to be in that position. So am I going to hand her a cell phone? Do I have her sitting on her phone the whole way to the basketball game and back? Doing what? That's a challenge. I'm not saying pick one or the other. I'm saying you and I have to understand the complexity of kids feeling left out because they're not on technology, but also the dangers of them being on technology and saying that I have a great deal of compassion that my kids are growing up and they feel weird or isolated because they have parents that are thinking about these things and much more hesitant. And by the way, though, I can't tell you how many times when I'm talking to parents in counseling and I say, you've got to be monitoring their phone. You've got to be getting their phone out of their room at night or you've got to be doing whatever X, Y, and Z is. They say, Julie, you don't know the fights I'm going to get into when I go home and do this. And you don't know how many times I hear, nobody else does this. You're a weird parent. Nobody else does this. Nobody else takes my phone away at 9.30 at night. Nobody else makes me keep it in their room. Nobody else does it. And sad to say, I always answer that by, well, there's actually at least one weird parent that does that with you. So you're not alone. And that there's probably five more in the world that exist as well. Um, but sadly, it's so true. 
I am consistently surprised when parents come into counseling and, I mean, the stories are horrific that can happen. You have young people who are being exposed to pornography online and their parents don't know. You could be sitting at the dining room table. It used to be that you had to leave the home and go to places you shouldn't be going to buy pornography and risk public humiliation of being seen or being caught. But now you can sit there at the dining room table with your children and they could be watching it or exposed to it or hearing things and you never know. Because that's what this does. Not that's what your children are prone to go after, but it is prone to pursue them. So here they are being exposed to it. They've got no redemptive input or guidance to what to do with what they're seeing and what they're being exposed to. Or you have a young girl, and the, again, a lot of uh, research is showing girls are being um, addicted to pornography as much as young men are now because it's being viewed, it's being there right in front of them, or they're being pursued by it. So you have all this stuff happening, and you and I as parents are utterly unaware it's happening because we're not seeing it, or they're hiding it really well, or we're not monitoring it. And then you have a young person, a 12-year-old boy or a 10-year-old boy who's seeing it, and they're thinking, huh, that's what people do. That's what sex is. That's what this is, looks like. Well, I want to experience that. And what do they do? They turn to a sibling, and they act it out on a sibling. And all of a sudden, you have greater, deeper problems happening in a family. And this is happening more and more and more because kids don't know what to do with the images they're seeing. They don't know how to make sense out of their experiences. And so they begin making sense out of it themselves. And they begin acting out. And often, we're seeing a lot more um, siblings acting out sexually on siblings as a result. And this is all tied together. And I won't blame that all on social media, but I will say technology has just made it easier. And it's made it harder for us to gauge and protect our children. And even when we are being protective, we can't, we can't protect them from other friends and peers who are having those things as well. So do you feel the weightiness of how to navigate that? And unless you are probably somebody like me who is in the field, or unless you're working with t teens and peers and you're hearing these things, you're probably unaware of how often it happens. And it can feel overstated. So that's part of the struggle, that we have this cultural pressure that I don't want my kid or my child to feel odd or weird. And if everybody in their class has a cell phone, well, who am I to deprive my child from having a cell phone? And if I put the, the best bet, bent on it, I love to make my kids happy. I like to bless my kids. I want to do good things for them. So to think of them opening up a new iPhone on Christmas morning, what a wonderful feeling to watch them do that. Um, so I can, I can see the, the draw to it as well, but also say, but are they prepared? Are they aware? Are you and I aware? So we also feel inadequate knowing how to catch up with things, keep up with what's going on. Again, I do this for a living, and I often feel inadequate because there's so much constantly evolving and keeping up with. And I think one of the ways we handle that is by saying, yeah, we probably will be inadequate, but we can find people that are adequate and we can follow principles and guidelines that help guard their hearts and protect them. I think sometimes we value compliance over relationship, or I say regular dialogue. What do I mean by that? that? If I just want my kids to obey, and they're being good at home, they're coming home, doing their homework, keeping up with their grades, and obeying, well, I don't really care if they're on their phone all the time. And what do we hear? That's what teens do. That's what they all do, right? And we value that if they are being compliant to me, that I don't really care that they're not relating to me anymore. Now, when you say it that way, Julie, that sounds really harsh. Of course I care about relationship with my kids. Think how many times, and this is the temptation as a parent, and I've been there myself, how many times it is far easier to occupy our kids than to entertain our kids. How many times I want to occupy them so I can get done busy work or the laundry or cook dinner or have a conversation with another adult. And I'm occupying them with these, these gadgets and this social media and Netflix and all these things so that I can sit and get things done. And there's a subtle shift that we think our kids are safe because they're right in front of us on the Xbox. Or we think our kids are safe because they're right in front of us on the phone and we feel good. We don't feel bad about not really giving them our full attention because they're right there with us and it feels like it's a safe and we're all together. But how many families are all together in the same room and they've not had one meaningful conversation for an entire evening? 
Parents are on the TV watching a movie, kids are on Xbox, somebody else is on the computer, and we say, isn't this nice? We all spent the night together. But you walk away and the kids were in a whole other world that you weren't even aware of, and there was no, no real relationship and discipling happening in that context. And so I think there's this facade that we are together, my kids are safe, I am interacting with them, but we're really not, and it's very subtle. We look for quick fixes rather than teaching stewardship. And again, I like stewardship because I think it's a biblical principle that we need to imply. But I also think no matter how much stewardship, we're opening them up to some dangerous things. And what does it look like to gauge that? I love quotes, and so you'll see probably way too many of these. But here's one that says, in many a Christian home, a child is told what he may and may not do but is not trained to understand why. That method, quite frankly, is lethal. Deep within, he lacks the rationale, the conviction necessary to stand alone against a powerful world system. That's what I'm talking about, that our kids lack that rationale. They lack that ability, the conviction to stand in something that is so powerful to them, that is so moving. It's like a tide that we're expecting them to swim up against when they lack the resources to do that. And I do quite honestly wonder, you and I could, could give them all the resources we have to offer and would they still be able to swim upstream? Is the tide too strong? And so we're expecting them too early to be able to, to fight against the tide. Now that's just me being a little argumentative for the sake of argument, but there's truth to it. I don't think we give them the skills quickly enough or long enough or regularly enough. And what that really means is we're mentoring, discipling. We are constantly in their lives helping make sense out of their experiences. But why are we not doing that? Because they've got that piece and they're doing that with somebody else. So do you see the dilemma? that in order to give them this thing, we have got to be more proactive, more involved, more engaged with them, but it's also the reason we're less engaged and struggling to be more engaged with them. Do you see the complexity of it? So rules without relationship equal rebellion. I did not create this. I don't actually know who does, but we're crediting Josh McDowell to it. What I love about this is rules without relationship equal rebellion. This goes back to kids who are constantly taught to do or not to do, but never given conviction, never really talked about relationship and the reasons behind why we do the things we do to honor God and to live in relationship with him, to love him well. They lack the resources and they end up rebelling. The fascinating thing though is the opposite is true as well, that kids with relationship and no rules end up rebelling as well, right? All the license in the world. I hear kids all the time say, I just wish they would send me to bed. I wish they would ground me. I wish they would tell me I couldn't go out because it would show me they cared. That both of those things are necessary to really love kids well. Trust and not submission defines obedience. So again, here's this theme that what is going to win the hearts of our young people is relationship. Relationship, relationship, relationship. And ultimately, our relationship is meant to point to relationship with the Lord. It's meant to model what a loving relationship with the Lord looks like. But here's the struggle. Their hearts are being captured by something else. They are pursuing their desires, and they're being taught they should desire something else. And our voice is slowly being pushed out of the picture. I love Deuteronomy 6 for this reason. Um, You just have this this principle uh, of talking all the time, of relating all the time, whether you sit, whether you rise, whether you walk along the way, whether you're, you're sitting down for dinner, whether you're in the family van, wherever you are, are we speaking truths? Are we talking about the things of God? Are we making the most of every opportunity? Let me stop there for a minute and just give you some examples to being really practical. I have such a passion for this to say, my children are moral responders. They will choose someday who they serve, but I'm gonna do everything in my power to show them why they wanna serve the Lord. And then they're gonna make a decision. So that means I better make the most of every opportunity. I need to look for ways to talk to them. And the best time to do that is when they are in the van and they are buckled in and they have no place else to go because they're a captive audience, literally. So we're always looking for ways to engage them. And we're not anti 
media and having a movie on on long trips. But as a general rule of thumb, we will have them all shut stuff off or not have a movie on just so we can talk. And imagine what happens. They talk. Why? Probably because they're so bored to death and there's nothing else to do that they sit and talk to each other. And we've had some of the best conversations in our car. And as a matter of fact, they've said some of the best things to me in the car as well. So there are numerous times where because there was no social media to occupy them, it brought them into conversation with us. But I have no doubt if they had phones and if they had a movie on, there would be no conversation happening either. It's not just about waiting for them to have conversation with me. It's I need to pursue young people. I need to do that in counseling. I need to do that in ministry in the church. I need to do that in my own home. I need to bring up the hard subjects because I need to model to them that in this home we can talk about anything hard. There's nothing too hard that we can't handle. There's nothing too embarrassing we can't handle. And even if I'm mortified and embarrassed by the things that come out of their mouth, I'll try to act as cool, calm, and collected as possible so that I can model that this is safe to have these kind of conversations. Social media gets in the way of that, though. Or technology, when it's always in their hands, gets in the way of those things happen. So we really want to say, how can we be more and more convicted that we want to take the most of every opportunity to engage our kids, to show them the glories of God, to make it beautiful to them, and to woo them to them? It's so important. What are we aiming for? So another way of saying it is that my teenager understands that every area of life in the context of God's world and how to live in wise, godly ways. How do we do that with technology? Again, another neat quote. Have we talked with our children this week about the delights of living more than the disciplines of living? Have we inspired and guided them more than we have corrected them? Why is that important? Because I want my kids to enjoy talking to me, right? And they're not going to enjoy it if it's always lecture mode. And that's true in counseling. Again, that's true in ministry. I want to just sit down and my kids to think, wow, my parents just like talking to me. Not about anything big. And by the way, if you really want to understand the heart of your teenager or a teenager, don't ask them what's going on in their life. Ask them what's going on in their friend's life. Because they'll tell you, and they'll tell you without any qualm of all the bad things their friends are doing and all the things they're into and all the inappropriate stuff and good stuff and bad stuff alike. And you're getting a window into their heart. You're getting a window into what they experience and how they're making sense out of it. And then the next question for me is often, well, What do you think about that? And now I'm seeing a reflection of what they think about it, because they feel safe telling you their opinions of their friends, but they might not feel safe saying, Mom, I struggle with that too, or I have a hard time with that. When you are working with teens in counseling or in ministry, and you ask them those same questions, you get a lot more when you ask them first about their friends. And then you slowly lean into, well, how does that affect you? What do you think about that? Hey, that must be hard. Have you ever struggled with that? And you see how kids feel more safe and vulnerable when they really genuinely understand you're listening and you're wanting to understand their world. One of the things I say often is be proactive, not reactive. It is far better to proactively shape the way a teen thinks about a subject than to have to go back and debunk inaccurate views. And one of the struggles in parenting especially, but culturally and even in the church is, We wait far too long to inform the way kids think about hard topics like sex and sexuality and and grief and loss and adoption and all these hard topics. And a lot of times it comes from our own insecurities. It comes from our own fears. It comes from our own inadequacies. Or we think, well, if our teen isn't bringing it up, then they're not thinking about it. You couldn't be more wrong. I couldn't be more wrong. They are thinking. Children are interpreters. They're worshipers. They are always thinking. They're always making sense out of their life and experiences. The problem is they're doing it without any loving guidance. They're doing it without any adult loving guidance, I should add, because peers are influencing peers nonstop with social media. They have something to say, and they're informing at all times what your teen or your child should think about such things. The question is, are you and I actively speaking just as much, if not more? Years ago at CCEF, we did a conference, and I did a workshop on talking to kids, teaching sex in the home, talking to kids about sex. And I say things, and it's probably going to come up on a slide, I say talk often, talk freely, talk soon, really 
We need to talk to kids about hard topics. We need to inform the way they think about subjects, not wait for the world to inform it, and then us to try to go back and debunk it. That I'd rather inform. Another principle that I said earlier is God creates, the world corrupts. And far too often, adults wait for kids to be corrupted by views of sex and sexuality, and then they go back and they try to debunk that. And we never get to talking about the way it was created, and that it was good, and in a rightly ordered, godly way, it thrives, and it's a wonderful thing. We're only talking about the corruption of it, and we're waiting until they've already been corrupted and they've interpreted it. So anyway, I was doing this whole seminar and having this conversation about how important it is Sex was just one example of many hard topics we need to talk about before kids are exposed to it, and social media exposes them very, very early. So I'm having this conversation, and I thought, you know, sounds like my kids are overeducated. And at the time, my kids were all under 11 years old, and I thought, wow, this sounds like I'm arguing for overly educating our children, and I probably talked too much about it. And I thought, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to videotape all of my kids. I'm going to ask them all the same questions, videotape them, and demonstrate that they're not, they're not skewed. I haven't corrupted their innocence. I have informed their innocence in a very creational, good way. I've talked in developmentally appropriate child ways about how God created man and, men and women different, and God creates sex, and it's good in marriage, and why it's good. So anyway, let me cut to the chase. So I thought, well, this will be fun, because I'm going to be able to show off how well they know everything. Well, didn't they prove me wrong? I videotaped each one of them, and I asked simple questions like, what makes boys and girls different? Um, where do babies come from? Uh, what is sex? Who should have sex? It was very interesting. So our kids were all, at the time, four years apart, all under the age of 11. Um, so in our home, at least, one of our principles was we want to talk openly. So we would have the conversation together. We'd read child-appropriate books together because we wanted to foster, this is perfectly normal. We talk about this. We're moms and dads. God created it. It's a good thing. God created bodies. We show respect for them. And God created boys' bodies and girls' bodies different. Blah, 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 blah. You get the picture. So I decided I'm going to videotape them each. And they're probably going to all say the exact same thing because they've heard the exact same thing. Not at all. So I start with the youngest, and I work my way up. So I start with the youngest. I say, hey, buddy, what makes boys or girls different? He's like, mm, God's awesome power. <laughs> OK. All right, I'll take that. That's a good answer. And I said, well, um, OK, buddy, where did, where did babies come from? Mm, God's awesome power. <laughs> OK. All right, well, um, what sex? Mm, I don't know. OK. So I'm shaking my head. He, about five times, he said, God's awesome power in his little squeaky voice. I'm like, OK, well, there's worse things he could get from this. So I'm glad if he thinks God's awesome power is I'm starting off right. Like, there's the foundation, right? God's awesome power create everything. We're off to good start, and we'll fill in the details later. I move to his brother, and I say, all right, Andrew, what, what makes boys and girls different? He goes, hmm, well, boys have short hair, and girls have long hair. OK. Anything else? Hmm, I don't think so. OK. I said, well, how about where do babies come from? And he goes, well, oh, they come from mommy's bellies. Yeah, well, how do they get there? Um, well, you need a mom and dad. Yeah. <laughs> and he couldn't give me any more. So I'm like, oh, OK, all right. I said, well, what sex? Um, I don't know. OK. So. I asked him a few more questions. It was basically kind of a really simple idea. So then I get to my, one of my daughters. I say, hey, honey, what makes girls or boys different? Well, boys have short hair, and girls have long hair. Isn't this interesting? I'm like, in a million years, I've never taught my kids that what makes boys and girls different are their hair length. <laughs> why, do they, why do they say that? Why is the first thing they say? Because it's their observation. So st stop and think for a minute. I'll, I'll fill you in with a little bit more. But here my kids were demonstrating, no matter how much I was teaching them what made boys and girls different, what was winning them over is what they observed. That was a really important lesson for me to say, I can be as proactive as I want, and I still have a battle on my hands. Because kids are going to go out into the world, and they're going to look around and say, well, what do I observe about it? What does mom and dad say? Now what am I going to believe? 
So it was so great. I look back and I think, wow, I'm so glad I did this. So anyway, I move on to my daughter. What makes boys or girls different? Well, girls have sh long hair, boys have short hair. Okay, I'm giving up here. This is a total loss. I haven't taught them anything. Well, honey, where do babies come from? Mm, drinking mother's milk? No, 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 you have that backwards. <laughs> That's wrong, all wrong, no. That, I, what sex, honey? And she's like, well, moms and dads are married. Yeah, anything else? Couldn't come up with anything else. Then we moved to my daughter, my oldest, and I said, honey, what makes boys or girls different? And she goes, oh, that's easy. She goes, boys have penises, girls have vaginas. Said, yes, that's right, honey. And she goes, and boys have short hair and girls have long hair. <laughs> and then she adds, and I'm like, oh, that's so interesting. And she adds, and by the way, I think girls can jump higher than boys. <laughs> okay. okay. I said, well, honey, what, um, what were some of my questions? Where do babies come from? And she goes, well, moms and dads have sex and they have a baby. I'm like, that's right, honey, really good. And I said, um, well, who should have sex? And she goes, well, everybody should have sex. <laughs> and I went, no, no, everybody should not have sex. But in her mind, we had taught a very inspiring view of, you know, God creates sex, sex is good. So in her mind, everybody should have sex. And I'm like, no, no, everybody should not have sex. Honey, what would happen if a teenager has sex? And she goes, hmm, they would go to jail. <laughs> All right, you can keep thinking that. I'll, I'll keep that one. Right. So what's my point in telling you that drawn out story? That point is children are interpreters, right? My point is here is a family who is proactively talking. As a matter of fact, so much I thought, oh, I've overeducated my children. Did it sound like they were overeducated? No, it sounded like they were miseducated, as a matter of fact. That is so telling for us that the world is going to be bombarding them with messages at all times. That's what social media does. Social media has really great things to say, people, but it also has a lot of messages. And my battle, your battle, is uphill as it is. Are we understanding the gravity of the messages they're getting from the world around us. And we've got to proactively shape that. We've got to be involved in it. So it does make me, the more I counsel, the more I see it, the more it makes me much more hesitant that we so openly expect kids, young people, to have phones, that we so openly expect that it's just normal for them to be on them all the time. We're not even fighting the battle. So can you understand? I'm compelling you to say, you've got to at least fight that battle. We've got to struggle with what does it look like to say, I want to teach my kids something very different, and they're going to struggle with it because it's not normal. It's not what they have. But children are interpreters, and they will be interpreting things left and right. And the problem is that if you and I are disengaged from them, we won't even know what they're being exposed to. The skill is to listen. The gift is to hear. So again, you and I have to be better at fostering conversation, of talking often with them, of pursuing things. So just speaking in the family context, our dinner time, um, and we're busy. We have nights where we don't have dinner together, but we try to very proactively have as many meals together as possible. And we very proactively do not have cell phones at the table, including my husband and I. And we've told them over and over again, you can call us out on it. And believe me, they do. We can be out to dinner with them, and they can say, hey, what time's the movie starting? And we, we go to look at it or look up whatever we're doing, and they're like, hey, you're on your phone. Get off your phone during a meal. What? You just asked me to do this. Um, but we have got to model it. We have got to model that being on the phone is not more important than being in relationship with them. And I will say to my kids, guys, you're more important than me than anybody else. I value you. And so if you think I'm ignoring you and on my phone, you have permission to tell me that. I want to be humble and hear that. I need to hear that. Um, so talking often with them. But it's not just sitting at a table quietly for an hour having a meal and not fostering conversation, right? You and I have to pursue them. Why? Because everybody else is pursuing them. We've got to pursue them. We've got to want to demonstrate we want relationships. So they've got two parents who are counselors in their lives. So they're just oozing with us forcing conversation upon them. And, we do try to get really creative with it. So we'll do things like we'll play agree, disagree. And what that is just simple, we just made it up. Or let's go around the, the table. We've got five kids, so this gets pretty lively. We go around the table, we'll say, do you agree or disagree? Um, secrets are bad. And everybody gets to air their opinion. 
share why they agree or disagree, and then they go on to the next person. Now, there's several really good things about that. One is we're fostering the art of conversation, right? We're saying, we want to talk to you. The second is we're also teaching them the gift of skill and debate. Tell me why you agree or disagree. What do you agree or disagree about that? Thirdly, as a parent, I've got a window into how they're thinking. I am gleaning where they're thinking well about things or where they're really off base about things. And so it's giving me a window into their heart in really positive ways. And then usually my husband and I will go last because it means we get to hear what they say and we can try to then speak and inform it at the end of it. And we let them each do it too. So sometimes we have the most nonsensical agrees and disagrees, like Batman's the greatest superhero and why Batman's not the greatest superhero because Batman really doesn't have any powers, those of you who know Batman, right? He is just really ingenious and rich. Um, or pizza's the greatest meal on earth. So we'll have all kinds of ridiculous conversations that we're willing to engage in, but we better take it to the serious conversations. Agree or disagree, homosexuality is good and right. Agree or disagree, um, I don't know, peers, everybody should have a cell phone. You know, we have these conversations because we want to get our kids thinking and we want, to, we want to see a window into their hearts and how they're thinking and be able to speak back into it. For parents and families that can't think that way or don't naturally think that way, there's all kinds of neat things. There's something called table topics and you can go on Amazon and a lot of places and find them, but Amazon has them. You can Google table topics and it's this square clear box and they have different things like family or a social gathering. And they're just, you pull a table topic and ask a question. Like, what's your favorite memory? Or what's your favorite Easter together? Or what's your belief about this or that? And again, we just go around the table and everybody answers it. And do you know, they're teenagers now. And they will ask, can I pull the topic tonight? They want to pursue that because they enjoy talking. They enjoy being able to share their opinions. And we want to foster delighting in letting them share their opinion. I want a window into their soul and knowing how to speak into that. So we've got to be better at finding ways. I don't have to be brilliant and come up with all kinds of topics. I just have to know what the resources out there and use them to effectively want to engage our young people well. And that's true of each other, right? We could all go out to dinner together and be sitting around and our phones are right there and picking them up and engaging them. Or we could sit there and we could actually ask questions or pull table topics and really get to know people. There is a, an effort that it takes that sometimes we don't, we don't take to know them well. So what are we trying to teach teens? That they need to realize that everything they put online is both public and permanent. So let me throw out a bunch of principles about social media. Um, there is a man who came up with a book named Public and Permanent. His name, I think, is Richard Gurry. But he talks about everything you put out there on social media is both public, meaning really privacy settings are a facade. And he actually, I was in a workshop watching him, and he would go online and he found a MySpace account that was closed 15 years ago, probably 20 years ago now, and he was able to unlock it and open it in front of the whole room of people and demonstrate this is a deleted account that shouldn't even exist anymore and I can find access to it. I just needed to know one or two important informations. There are apps, by the way, telling you how you can hack into people's Facebook accounts. So if you and I know that, guess who else knows that? The bad people who want to hack into our accounts, right? Nothing is really public. It's a facade online. Everything is permanent. Deleted things that you thought you deleted years ago can still be tracked down in the right hands and the right tools. So teaching young people that really that's part of the facade too, right? I feel this sense of privacy that I can do things without people knowing who I am and helping them understand that you're accountable, first of all, before the Lord. That transparency and accountability is a gift. You should be willing to do that and be that. But also, it's really a facade to think that anything you do online is private. Uh, so there's no such thing as privacy settings. Parental controls have holes. So if you and I are simply relying on parental controls, kids are a master at getting around them. There are great apps like, out there like Bark, like uh, Disney Circle. We use that in our own home, but I know my kids can get around it. Not to mention kids that are really rebellious will just go up to the circle and unplug it from the internet. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. There's always a way around it, which is why if we don't capture our children's hearts and souls, parental controls will never, never protect them. 
there will always be holes, and their hearts, it's like putting, putting out these external boundaries around their life, but the moment those boundaries are gone, because their hearts haven't changed, they're gonna go wild, they're gonna go off the cliff. So we need to put the external boundaries around them because it's our job to protect them and keep them safe, but really what we want to do is guard their heart and capture their hearts for the Lord. That's got to be key. And we've got to show them why some of those things run dangerous. And I don't want to talk to my kids like social media is evil and bad. It's, God isn't for it. I want to talk about the dangers of social media and the dangers of pushing out real relationships in the midst of it. Uh, teach that God creates, the world corrupts. God creates sex, the world corrupts it. God creates relationships, the world corrupts it. God creates enjoyment and pleasure, the world corrupts it. We want to instill, that's that proactive instilling how God created really good things, but you're going to be exposed to the corruption of it. And here's how you know the corruption of it. And I love that example where, uh, of um, counterfeit money where they tell me, any of you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they tell me that those who can spot counterfeit money can spot it because they've spent years studying the real thing. They don't study the counterfeits, they study a real dollar bill, a real hundred dollar bill, and they know it so well that when the corruption of it is out there, they can spot it. Well, that's what we want our kids to do, right? We want them to know what is created and good that God has created and that they value that and want it so much that when they spot the corruption, they immediately know it's corrupted. That takes work, that takes relationship, that takes effort on our part. So we want to instill personal convictions to do that. We want to talk to kids as a prevention. Um, we want to inform what is respectful, what is appropriate and responsible with technology and tools. We want to communicate a Christ-like mindset that I'm called to love people even behind a screen, right? Isn't that interesting how it goes out the window? And I've seen this in email. I've seen this in church ministry and from, from the public forum that even Christians can be very unkind and harsh in the way we treat each other out in the public forum or out in cyberspace. And we somehow feel more justified to do that. I want to have a Christ-like mindset. I want to talk in respectful, kind ways, even with the people I disagree with at all times. I want to imitate Christ. I want to teach my kids to do that. We're teaching, repeatedly shaping where identity is found and value is found because they're finding it in their peer group. They're finding it in what their peers value. We want to teach self-restraint, not cave to cultural norms, and know the temptations our children face. So even though I can assume I can give three of my children a cell phone and assume I know immediately what some of the temptations are, their hearts are prone to wander in different ways, right? They're gonna struggle with sinful tendencies in different ways, and so knowing kids individually and understanding how they might use or misuse technology is gonna be really beneficial as well. One of the things I love to say to parents, it's never too late. I don't care how old your child is, how many mistakes you've made, it is never too late to undo anything. And that's the hope of the gospel, that I can believe Jesus can redeem even what's been broken and what's gone wrong. But then I will start saying, you've got to get technology away from them, or you've got to get it away from them at night. So some of it's, it's just really contextual, like what's going on in the moment, what's going on in that home and family. But I have a lot of families who said, Julie, I, I never knew that I should be taking cell phones out of the room, or I never knew that, I, that they were on social media, or that these were some of the dangers. And I'll say, well, this is a hard way to learn, but now you know. So what are some principles and rules you can follow in your home that will help? So really good kids push back because I really think in their naiveness, they are unaware of the issues and the problems. And so in their naiveness, they think they also are immune from those problems. They think, I wouldn't do that, or I'm never going to do what my peers do. And I really genuinely think they believe that, but they've never had the temptation in front of them. They've never been exposed to it. So understanding that, I know you believe that, honey, and I know you feel like you are mature enough to make this decision, but until you can keep yourself safe, it's my job to keep you safe from the things that you don't even know are out there. And then I'll get the, well, I know what's out there, mom, and I know this and this and this and this. And I'll say, okay, that's fair. So, well, tell me what you would do if this would happen. Tell me what you would do if this has happened. So now I'm throwing scenarios at them and I'm getting them to think. And I'm kind of challenging, have you thought through this and this and this and how do you demonstrate it? I have, I have one or two kids where I think they probably could handle a cell phone but I'm not gonna get them a cell phone yet. Um, 
Then I have one of my kids where I think until she's 40, she won't have a cell phone. Um, because you know them well, and you know the temptation is just way too great that the moment she gets it, she's going to be off the cliff real quick, right? And so knowing each of your kids and knowing where they are prone to struggle, and then there are things you and I can't predict. Because again, I think there's these you have culture, you have these outside systems coming at our kids that we don't know about. So that's where it's hard for you and I to, to do that. So the more you and I take time to build relationship and hesitate on the technology, or we, we give it incrementally in ways where we can see what they're doing with it, that's really important too. So I have nothing against kind of testing the waters and say, let's see how they handle a, this use of technology and when they're allowed to use it. And I think that's wisdom because when my kids are going to fail, I want them to fail in ways that I can pick them back up, or I want them to fail in ways they learn from it, and the Lord works in their life through that. So I don't want to throw them in the deep end of the pool. I'd rather teach them the skill of wading in and understanding how to use it. So that said, I think we often have to consider that anybody who gives social media to kids, you have to ask how old, and maturity and responsibility are the principles behind that, right? So a natural question I get is, well, then at what age should kids have technology? And I'll say, well, I don't know. Why? Because I don't know your child. And I don't know how you're going to guard their hearts. And I don't know what kind of conversations you've had. And I don't know how mature and wise they are. And I don't know if they're going to be tempted towards certain things that they'll be granted access to. All those things matter. It also matters that we are guarding it for them, that we're not allowing technology in rooms and bedrooms and letting them sleep with it at night, and that we're understanding that my relationship, I've got to work harder and harder at my relationship with them if I really want to win them over. 